This episode is brought to you by IT Pro TV, binge worthy learning for IT teams. Why is it binge worthy? It's learning presented in an engaging and entertaining talk show format that beats voice over PowerPoint snooze fests. IT Pro TV offers an on demand course library with more than 3,300 hours of content. Watch on your desktop, on the go, or in the comfort of your own living room. IT Pro TV is IT training you and your team actually want to watch which means a better return on your learning investment. Get started with IT Pro TV for Teams with a special offer for Security Weekly listeners. Visit itpro.tv forward slash Security Weekly to start a seven day free trial and get 30% off a standard or premium IT Pro TV membership using the code SECWEEKLY30. Pony Express, check out their line of penetration testing devices, including the Pone Pad, Pone Phone, and Pone Pro. For enterprises, there's Pone Pulse, providing continuous visibility into wired, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth spectrums across all physical locations, including remote sites and branch offices. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. Stop attackers from domain credential theft and lateral movement with a 99% success rate by using artificial intelligence to control the attacker's perception of the environment. Javelin Networks is the world's first endpoint intrusion containment platform to protect domain networks. Javelin detects targeted attacks and breaches by obfuscating Active Directory, domain controllers, domain identities, domain credentials, and all domain resources. It only takes one compromised machine to jeopardize the entire organization. Don't be a victim. Visit javelin-networks.com and request a demo of AD Protect today. Welcome back, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. If you missed one of our previous webcasts and you want to check them out, you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. If you're interested in John Strand and myself talking about the state of penetration testing, that webcast is up. You can get it at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. Make the most of your penetration testing activities by listening to that webinar and hearing our take on that subject. All righty. Hey, we're in enterprise security news. Um, the first story that I have here is kind of interesting with threat metrics uh, teaming up with Global One Pay. It was interesting in their write-up. They they put a lot of numbers in there. And I mean, numbers are impressive, I guess. Big I, numbers. Big numbers. Like, they offer insights into 1.4 billion anonymized user identities to deliver intelligence for 100 million daily authentication decisions. Now, what's interesting, you may read the, the numbers and go, well, that's kind of interesting. However, when we talk about security of transactions to detect fraud, it's a lot easier than what Lenny was talking about previously about, you know, detecting general malware that you really don't understand its intent. You may not know what it wants to do yet. Um, but with fraud, like, you know, it wants to commit fraud and you know your transactions <sighs> look a certain way. And so this is probably a very successful uh, partnership and probably a very successful platform for detecting fraud is at least what I find. Lenny and John, I'm not sure what your your mileage is on that, but I I, I think that this type of uh, analysis is important. But the thing that bothers me is uh, it seems like I screw up my uh, my uh, zip code once and it locks my my card out. But if my card is being used simultaneously in New York City and Kuala Lumpur, it's like no 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 that's okay that's cool we'll mm -hmm. let that go through. Um, but but I think that this type of analysis, like you said, it should, on the face of it, be a lot easier. But whenever you're trying to aggregate credit card transactions across multiple different banks, multiple different resources at the exact same time, it can be somewhat difficult, not necessarily from like the task itself, but getting the right data set being fed into it in a timely fashion so you can actually find those correlations um, rather than working on somewhat stale data. Uh, Lenny, what's your take on like credit card transaction fraud detection? You know, it's a fascinating area, but one that I frankly don't have any expertise to comment on. Okay. We don't either, but we we just commented <laughs> on it. Anyway. We we comment anyway. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's how we roll. We roll. Here. One thing I, I I do want to comment on is this next story about Palo Alto uh, is launching a cloud based analytics platform. And it's interesting. This is something that I, I remember Matt Alderman and I talking about um, where it's going to go. This whole notion of SIM in the cloud of taking your logs and or some kind of metadata about your logs, storing that in the cloud, and then using their cloud platform to analyze it. I, and I guess my, my concern at face value is I think that many people think this could be cheaper to store your logs in the cloud or, or have some cloud-based mm -hmm. solution. But when you look at all your cost points, 
that John and I have had a lot of conversations about, your CPU compute, your data in, your data out, and your storage, does it really make sense for every organization to do this? Probably not. Um, I, uh, hmm. it's, you know, I, I go back to uh, ProtectWise. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've, talk, we've had some people, I think ProtectWise does some really cool things with full data packet capture up in the cloud and reassembly. But whenever you start getting into really, really large networks and you start dealing with sharding, across databases in the cloud and trying to rectify all of that, it gets very difficult very quickly uh, to actually implement that effectively. And like you mentioned, the concept of data charges and how much Amazon charges or Azure charges for data ingest, if you do it wrong, you can very quickly end up with a, with a data bill that's just astronomical. And I'm trying to figure out what other than, so Paul, you can speak to this a little bit better than I can. From a marketing and sales perspective, why C-Os want their products to be in the cloud. But whenever I'm looking at a customer perspective, I'm getting more and more pushback from customers to actually have their security technologies in the cloud. Not necessarily from the security of it, but from the perspective of exactly what you just talked about with the data charges. So what are the drivers that you see that f kind of push companies to wanting to be as cloud-based as they possibly can in their product offerings? Well, I, th I think it is cost, right? I don't know it's cost. It's it's uh, operational realities. You know, at, uh, in a prior role, I, I worked with, with uh, quite a few organizations that specifically wanted their analytics in the cloud or when you ask them what do they want, they, they wouldn't right away tell you, this is what I want. I want to shove as much data as I can into the cloud. But what they wanted was insights about the data that they're gathering from their endpoints, from their perimeter. Now, how should they get these insights? You could deploy your technology locally, you could deploy it in the cloud, but modern technology is becoming more and more complex to integrate, to deploy. Yes, we have lots of uh, freely available open source tools. We've got some commercial tools, but what I believe is pushing organizations to adopt cloud at large, not even with this particular solution, but in general, is the, the operational realities of what it takes to run a sophisticated um, application locally, what kind of staffing you need to have, what kind of expertise you need to have, with the ease with which you could just almost click a button and have this up and running. Um, right away without having a long-term project that might get derailed, priorities will get changed, it gets defunded, and the next thing you, you have is nothing after months but, of efforts of deploying it locally. But sometimes I think we're mixing multiple different things, right? So if you're dealing with like an application stack, uh, you're building an application that sells widgets, then cloud-based distribution makes a lot of sense, right? But whenever you're talking about like a security implementation where you're having multiple different log sources all dump into, let's say, a SIM in the cloud, that's actually fairly complicated. There's a lot of dancing moving parts that go along with it. And sometimes I fear that organizations, they see the cloud working for something and then they immediately think that it can work for all things. And I, I see a lot of organizations now starting to do a retreat on security in the cloud because that is difficult. Um, whereas I see where like cloud security does work is for like authentication across multiple different applications. I see cloud security working where you have a disparate workforce where it's not just centralized in a couple of locations, but everyone works from home. So it's like there is a solution there, but sometimes I don't feel like it's always the correct solution. And I think that that's what a lot of organizations just aren't getting. Yeah, I think you're right in that uh, you, you gotta, it's hard to generalize in some cases based on the nature of the data or the expertise that the IT team has, you've got to keep things locally versus running in the cloud. But you're right, in some applications, cloud is the best approach. In the case of the Palo Alto announcement, it seems like they're doing some deep analytics that probably require the kind of processing that um, might be difficult or, or expensive to deploy locally uh, for all organizations except the largest or most mature ones. Yeah, and that's one of the concerns that I have about this is anytime someone says that we're doing data analytics that would be expensive to do locally, I see absolutely no conceivable way how that's cheaper to do that in the cloud. Um, it, it's, 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 it's interesting because uh, almost any time you're doing any kind of big data analytics, lots of throughput, it gets more expensive very quickly in the cloud than it is to actually run it locally. The only thing it does buy you is you're no longer dealing with the operational realities of keeping your hardware up to date. You don't have to worry about hard drive failures. You don't have to worry about refreshing entire server farms. Mm -hmm. And there is abs there is real value in kind of sidestepping those issues. But once again, sometimes I, I think that there's more to the story than saying, yes, it's cheaper in the cloud because mm -hmm. no, it's not in a lot of scenarios. It's true. Uh, the next story is interesting about CrowdStrike I mean, the gist of the story is if you're in the UK and you're we're working with Cloud Distribution, that's actually the name of the, the, the company. That's the name uh, of the company. Yeah, yeah. CrowdStrike has changed, uh, and I think they're going to have a go at it on their own in the UK. What I thought was 
somewhat entertaining about this article was there's a picture of a, a hacker typing on a laptop and the caption to the picture <laughs> is hacker, hacker typing on a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> so in case you were wondering, that's a hacker typing on a laptop. Good to know. Just in case you're wondering. Uh, and a heads up if you may be working with CrowdStrike directly or a different distribution partner uh, if you're in the UK. Uh, Sumo Logic expands their security tool set with factor chain acquisition. Now, what the article says that Sumo bought with factor chain is a tool that can rapidly search across multiple systems to locate security data and find issues quickly. Uh, they remember what you found in the past, so security operations analysts don't spend a lot of time reinventing the wheel. Uh, it's kind of neat. Interesting problem, right? I never thought, uh, uh, you know, of that problem specifically. That you know, once I've done an investigation or collected security data, that I need to capture that for future reference. I guess in a lot of incident response tools, uh, address that issue. But this seems a little more encompassing, as it can locate your security data. Pretty interesting. Well, in large organizations, you got data stored on the endpoints that is very difficult to access if you have to reach each endpoint individually. So the idea of capturing this data set, storing it centrally so that you can, as an analyst, uh, mine it, look for patterns is, is, I think, very valuable. John, sorry, did you have comments on that? Or Nope. Um, let's see. A, a Kaseya? Do we, we've covered this company before. Kaseya VSA 9.5 includes support for Microsoft PowerShell to allow, allow remote scripting plus oh, enhanced file management to allow remote upload or download of multiple files or whole directories from a single interface. So this is a, a remote monitoring and management play uh, that they've enhanced their capabilities to include PowerShell support for managing uh, endpoints. Now, along with what Lenny was just saying, it's hard to collect data from all of your endpoints. I think this is more of a management play than a monitoring uh, play, but kind of interesting nonetheless. Well, this is uh, this is another one of those where you have MSSPs that you know we're trying we're seeing more and more of an integration between MSSPs and um, and and you know basically cloud management of organizations that can't have their own IT staff. And uh, Lenny, you've had a lot more experience in the MSSP environment than I have, uh, kind of working with them uh, through a number of companies that you've worked with in the past. Do we ever see like that MSSP approach to security actually be effective? Like, what does it actually take to actually have a really secure, a good relationship with your managed security service provider? Yeah. So the the term MSSP right now, managed security services provider, might be ambiguous, and it's also also worth bringing up another related term, which is MSP, managed service provider, and sometimes. The two terms could be used interchangeably. Sometimes there's a merge between the two companies. But here's here's what I think about when, when I think about the value of an basically an, an outsourced security partner. What responsibilities mm -hmm. do they have? In many cases, MSSPs focus on monitoring your environment and telling you when something anomalous or potentially malicious occurs, right? MSSP. And traditionally, they have gathered this information by looking at your network data. Now, um, we see more such organizations also looking at the endpoint to gather some in insights from the endpoint. But, but here is the only uh, concern that I have about I that relationship. Um, once they tell you that uh, something's wrong, then who is on the hook in addressing and further investigating and responding to the problem? Is it the partner or is it you? Sometimes it's defined in an ambiguous way. What I would want, mm -hmm. um, if, I, if I'm an organization that doesn't have a dedicated security staff, is somebody who can help me with both, detect the problem and resolve it um, if, if necessary. And, and I think that that's kind of the space that you have somebody like Asaya, where it's not just the MSSP, but just the MSP, mm -hmm. right? Where they're actually going to, through and doing remote management and monitoring and updating of your systems, that they're trying to step in and fill that role. And that brings up a whole nother set of problems because – those companies may be good at remote management and monitoring and patching and kind of watching systems, but they don't have the skills expertise. And I have seen a lot of these companies quickly get out of their depth where they have like, you know, like level tier one or tier two help desk person that's dealing with a computer that's now compromised. And now all of a sudden they're trying to step into the shoes of somebody like a forensics firm like Mandiant that would charge $400 an hour for the same like type of activity, but these people are not nearly as trained. 
Um, but as a customer, you're thinking that you're getting that kind of managed service provider and now you're getting the security on top of it. And it's almost like, well, we also have incident response on retainer because these people are monitoring our systems. And to have a company that can be experts across all three of those different areas, I just don't I just don't buy it. I just don't think it's there. Well, it, it'll happen, I think. Uh, it might, we might not be there at the moment, but, uh, but I have certainly mm -hmm. seen uh, MSPs trying to uh, increase their expertise and, and the set of tools that they use to assist with customers from a security perspective. I think uh, it's important for customers to understand where the strength of your partner is. And in some cases, mm -hmm. I imagine an MSP would partner with somebody else whom they might in if the case requires it. Right? But there's a lot that you can do from a security perspective with the initial triage to understand the nature of the problem and then decide whether you should be calling in a specialist. Otherwise, things get extremely expensive. Yes. The, one of the other articles that I added is uh, an area, a category, actually, that I've been researching, and that's how do you securely... Well, there's two aspects to it. This is more on the how do I securely build and document an API for my applications. I think another different use case is... Once I've either got my own APIs or other people's APIs that I'm interfacing with, how do I know that one, they're secure? And how do I know, two, if I'm interfacing with them in a secure manner? So the, the, the second problem that I described uh, is kind of interesting, and I'm not quite sure exactly what's out there in terms of solutions. However, this company called SmartBear uh, released a, a new product uh, or update to their product called Swagger Inspector. And what this allows you to do is once you've created an API, um, it can check if an API is working as intended, but it sounds like the, the real like, key feature is that it automatically generates documentation. So you point it at your API and it can automatically, using an open API specification, develop your documentation. I thought that was pretty cool I just wanna... and an interesting area of research uh, for me that's ongoing. I just want to let you know, Paul. We're con con right now. We're we're trying to come up with company names. Mm. Uh, we we can't do any worse than Smart Bear. That's true. 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 Smart just, Bear. Just saying. I mean, um, they probably yes, have it, a really cool. <laughs> they probably have a really cool logo, though. Listen, I didn't, I didn't when, actually uh, go to their I'm search. familiar with Smart <laughs> Bear. Logo is awesome from a QA perspective, and yeah. and uh, and I want to point out that there is a difference in QA testing and security testing of your product. Yes. Right. QA tests whether the product does what the specifications say it's supposed to do. When you're doing security testing, in many cases, you're testing whether you can go outside of the bounds of what the application was designed to do. So it's a slightly different mindset. Um, but, yeah, but, 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 in, but I think uh, there is a way to combine the, the function uh, uh, just as long as the, the right mindset is present. So, but I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go counter that a little bit. So, whenever you're testing the security of an API, right, it's different than it is as a web application. Um, it, it's a very, very, very different creature. So, as a penetration testing firm, a lot of times we're actually using development tools to actually do the testing. So, while this release is a kind of kind of an API for testing the documentation to make sure the functionality is correct, uh, we would use these types of tools. This and like, uh, Paul, have you played with Postman at all? I've heard of it. I've heard of it. Yep, I haven't played with that it would yet. be another yeah. one. But we do spend a lot of time using development tools that are actually like kicking out documentation, all joking aside about SmartBear's name. But if it actually automatically generates documentation of where all the API endpoints are, what the function calls actually are for that, that's huge for us actually doing a good penetration test against an API. So it's not, you know, th these lines, especially in this in this area with API testing, they definitely blur because there aren't very many good security tools out there that actually test API. So we have to go back to development tools mm -hmm. and reverse engineer and then go forward and do the security testing. And I think there's some blurred lines too, uh, you know, in our own application testing. I think there's there's functional testing, but there's also like a conditional testing to see if like I didn't check a boundary mm -hmm. or something. So I throw mm -hmm. garbage at the application and that's testing the resiliency of the app, but it can also mm -hmm. point out problem areas where like, Hey, I know in our own app, like, Hey, I test that field and I get an internal server error. Like that means you're not mm -hmm. checking what I'm putting into that field. So that could lead to a security yep. issue. So I think in that respect, there's some blurred lines, but absolutely, you know, functional testing, does the app do what it's supposed to? Then there's the kind of what I call like crash condition testing. We're going to throw a bunch of junk at it. And that's more for the resiliency, could lead to security. And then there's just straight, you know, security testing. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, the, the positive trend yeah. that I have seen in, in the way applications are being built since we're talking about APIs is that in many cases, you're building a web-based application that is using your own API. Mm -hmm. And that is the kind of API that you provide to your customers and to your integration partners. And so that's great because then the developer is using the very same API that somebody else is going to be using. It's not just a backdoor into the application. That makes it easier to focus your testing on the one way in which anyone can interact with it. Makes it, I think, uh, uh, easier to find. Uh, Lenny's flaws. so positive. I love, I love your optimism, <laughs> Lenny. <laughs> I yeah. just tend to see the negative side of it <laughs> because when you, when your application is using the API, and then you've got third parties using their API for their applications. What I see happening, being the doom and gloom in this <laughs> scenario, <laughs> is I want to update my yeah. application. Um, the company's application that's providing the API, right? And that means I need to change my API in some way. Mm. And that means you just broke everyone else. That's a problem. Using your you're API right. You're, and you're making a commitment well, when you publish an API. Yeah, True. Yeah. And but most of the time, whenever people are developing APIs, they're actually using some framework, whether they're using like Swagger or Node or any like Nordic or whatever. So you have all these different frameworks that exist. And when we're testing, a lot of times, let's say that the framework supports like 150 different API calls, uh, but the app is only using like three of those mm -hmm. calls. But yet all those other calls are still active live and going back and forth. Um, that's a huge problem. Uh, whenever we're testing apps, because a lot of times we can gain access by just simply making API requests that the customer thinks is off because their app isn't using it, mm. but their framework actually does support it and you can then gain access to it. So cool tools like this are Good awesome. Um, they're really, really cool things to play with. I've got a, the last story here is from Carbon Black and it's their predictive security cloud, which is a converged <sighs> endpoint protection platform delivering next generation, which we talked about, security and IT operation services through the cloud and ensures products and services are delivered in an effective time and manner, blah, blah, blah. Um, <clears throat> my notes here say I, I'm not in love with the problem. And they define it as the global threat landscape accelerates. Security teams often worry that an attack will slip through. Um, compounding this issue is a scarcity of cybersecurity staffing and expertise. Not sure I'm, I'm <sighs> quite there with you there. Um, they say especially SMBs lack dedicated security professionals to investigate and respond to the flood of alerts and attacks that they face. Even skilled professionals miss important alerts in their own environments. So I, I, I think that that's interesting that you talk about the problem statement, Paul, mm -hmm. because the problem statement here is not a customer problem statement. Uh, this is a carbon black problem solution. So it's a great let me observation, John. Yep. So carbon black's problem is uh, that they're solving with this. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing or a good thing. I'm just defining it is whenever you're trying to make decisions as to whether or not a process or an executable is good or bad, right? If you're constantly running that inside of one organization, you get this tremendous amount of white noise and there's no context as it relates outside of that organization. However, if you're dealing with anything that has any type of artificial intelligence or predictive security cloud, PC, PSC, whatever they call it, if you can integrate and you can cross-reference across hundreds or thousands of customers, then it makes it a lot easier to identify trends and anomalies and also baseline good traffic. So the more a security company can throw data into the cloud and have that cross-referenced with a whole bunch of other customers, the, it's the larger it's it's a larger worldview for that particular product, and it makes it easier for them to say, well, we're seeing this driver for HP show up in this customer, but it, the same driver is being used in these 15 customers, and it's been there for the past two years. It's probably not malicious. Whereas the context of just that one customer, where one user installs that driver, it generates an anomaly. Now we can look at it in a, across multiple different customers. So their problem. It's funny that you mentioned the problem statement. Mm. They're trying to sell this as a solution to a problem for their customers. But the reality I feel reading this, and anytime I see anyone saying we're moving all of our analytics into the cloud, it's really they're solving the problem of big data analytics for the company that's selling the product. Because the more data you have, the better your artificial intelligence, machine learning, and predictive security algorithms are going to be. Uh, but I'd love to get Lenny's uh, take on this too. Well, and I, I just, before we turn and over actually, Lenny. It, 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 with that, I'm going to have to listen to his response. I've got to go. All right, but, John, thank uh, you. I'll talk to you guys both later. Thank Bye. you. And I, what John was saying that kind of sparked in my mind was they're not, um, the problem is not that we miss alerts. The underlying problem is why do we miss alerts? And they're not like getting down into like the higher level problem. Yeah, we miss alerts. Sure, that's a problem. But why we're missing alerts, that's the bigger 
that's the bigger problem, right? Mm. It's the elephant in the room. I think you touched on that in your yeah, in well, the first segment too. Well, we we we, we talked earlier about the uh, my uh, optimistic view of the kind of analytics that you can perform in the cloud that mm -hmm. are practical to perform locally. I think one of the uh, scenarios where you have to do that kind of analytics in the cloud is when you're uh, aggregating data from multiple sites from multiple customers. Sometimes, as is the case in in this solution, presumably, um, to, to drive some intelligence. And now, uh, John mentioned uh, the uh, practical use of such information where you can see where something is normal or anomalous in, in one set of customers and therefore educate your understanding of what's happening in another set of customers. Mm. I think it's very valuable. Antivirus companies have been doing something along those lines for, for quite a few years as well yeah. with their reputation uh, focused uh, preventative technologies mm -hmm. where if you download a file that is new to the world if they have not seen it uh, in a lot of locations they might block the file preemptively because it's right. suspicious right? right so i think it's it's a similar approach similar way of thinking but in this case being taken into the world of, of data analytics and uh, uh, and, and detective uh, controls yeah and i i really believe that the underlying problem is context for the analyst right not having all of the context around the inter information that's internal, what's on my network, what's happening, and external, maybe what was it connecting to or what is connecting to me, uh, those contextual information is often what's lacking. I think that the overarching category uh, for this is a lot of companies basically trying to provide the SOC analyst with context. Context and is There's wonderful. like probably a hundred vendors that are really just focused on that kind of overarching problem of the analysts don't have the context that they need. Yeah, the, the analysts need the context, and context is key. And, and when uh, customers talk to us about the kind of alerts that we bring up when we prevent the infection, they ask us for more information so that they, if they want to, they can review the alert to see mm -hmm. um, the, the context of, of the scenario. But overall, why are we asking about the context? Why does the analyst care about the context? It's not because they're... in simply intellectually curious. It's because they're probably overworked, they got a million other alerts to look at, and they need very quickly at a glance to understand, is this important or not? Right. Right. Should I move on? Yeah. Is this a false positive? And, uh, and it's great that we have uh, more and more intelligence built into these solutions to make it easier for the analysts to make decisions faster. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, solutions that are also smart in avoiding any presentation of an alert to begin with if it's likely to be de deemed false positive automatically. Right. Lenny, are you still teaching for SANS? Yeah, yeah, I am, yeah. Tell me about what you're, what you're doing for SANS today. So for, for SANS, I've been uh, teaching for a long time malware analysis, and, uh, and, and I'm continuing to do so. It's okay. been a, a steady thread through my life for quite a few years now as, as I grow and, and change as a, as a professional. Um, right now, it's a topic that I think is very relevant to a lot of organizations, um, I started out doing that kind of stuff when, mm -hmm. when malware analysis was deemed to be a very niche topic yeah. and the oh, kind yeah. of thing that you would think only an AV companies should be able to do, but but now it's it's a very different world. That's awesome. Yeah. Where where do you, do you teach live events as well? I teach live events. Yeah, I teach every every other month approximately. Okay. Yeah, it's it's great. I love it because every time I, I teach uh, malware analysis, it reminds me that attackers keep evolving, their tools keep evolving, and I learn about what other people are seeing, and and that's something that helps me continue to grow as a malware analyst and also something that I can bring into the product uh, that I oversee. Yeah, that's a really good data exchange between it's great. You know, teaching. You learn a lot from your, I find this you're the instructor, but you learn a lot from your students. Absolutely, all the time, yeah. all the time, yeah. And, and I find that it's also very, very healthy once in a while to pluck yourself out of your day-to-day -day environment yeah. and, and, and go into a different place and, and, and try to solve a slightly different but hopefully related set of problems. It just... Mm keeps keeps it fresh and, and in, in my case maybe keeps me uh, an optimist that i think i am yeah <laughs> <laughs> the eternal optimist mr lenny zeltzer That's right. thank you very much for appearing in studio thank you everyone for listening and watching to this episode of enterprise security weekly we'll see you next time